Hello and welcome back to Math and Tea, the show where we talk math and drink tea. I'm your host, Professor Joseph Van Dye. So about a decade ago, wow, was it really a decade? Anyways, about a decade ago, there I was, an undergraduate at the University of Oregon, trying to figure out what in the world I wanted to do with my life. I'd always been a bit precocious at mathematics, but I uh, figured, ah, what the heck, maybe I should give this whole grad school thing a try. Only problem was, I really had no idea what went into it. I didn't really come from an academic family. I had one aunt who had gotten a master's degree and a couple distant relatives with advanced theological degrees, and really that was it. My decision to go to grad school felt like a big adventure for my family, one that we were going into blindfolded. And since I've got a bunch of my students asking me the same sort of questions that I was wanting to ask other people when I was their age, well, I figure it makes good sense to do a video about what grad life is really like and what the whole graduate experience is really about. As always, my focus will be on mathematics, and the math PhD program in particular, but a lot of what I say here will apply to other sciences and, to a lesser extent, the arts as well. To begin, let's talk about degrees and what those degrees actually mean. By way of comparison, let's do four. High school diploma, bachelor's, master's, and PhD. These are fairly standard across a bunch of different programs, with certain things like medicine and law doing different things. First off, the high school diploma. This represents a base level of knowledge that we expect all citizens of our society to know. It's a pretty standard, really. With the bachelor's degree, however, we begin to see specialization in the form of a major or minor, and so the bearer of a bachelor's degree is presumed to have specialized knowledge useful to people in that field. Next up, the master's degree. Now this, again, represents an even greater amount of advanced and specialized knowledge, but at the same time, it represents the capacity for understanding the cutting edge of modern research. This, in turn, is displayed through the master's thesis, and the master's thesis can take various different forms. Now, sometimes the master's thesis can represent brand new research, but more commonly, it represents a compilation of other people's work, going through all the details to show mastery of the work involved. As an aside, master's theses like these can be really useful to people like me, they bring together a bunch of disparate work into one handy place. Finally, we have the PhD. And once again, this represents an even greater amount of specialized knowledge. But the key to the PhD is the capacity to not only understand, but to add to the bulk of human knowledge. And that, of course, is done in the doctoral dissertation. As a result, the PhD, unlike the master's thesis, tends to almost always be new original research, because that's what the PhD is there to prove. So with that in mind, let's talk about the stages of grad life. With a master's program, there's not terribly much that's different from a bachelor's program, except the whole writing of the thesis thing. So you take some more courses that are a bit more intricate and a bit more complex, but the main deal is writing the thesis. So that involves finding an advisor, choosing a topic, researching, and then writing the darn thing. As a result, master's programs can really vary in length. I've heard of anywhere from one to three years. Doctoral programs, on the other hand, take a lot longer. We're talking five to six years being pretty common. Since they're so much longer, doctoral programs have a lot more distinct stages, three from what I would think of, the first of which is the written exam stage. Now these go by a lot of different names, comps for comprehensive exams, quals for qualifying exams, but the name doesn't really matter, they're written exams. Anyway, uh, most PhD programs will require you to pass a certain number of these exams before you move on with the program. I think I had to do about five. Now, usually there will be one in real analysis, one in abstract algebra, and then from there you kind of have a bit more freedom to choose which ones you want to do. Each exam has an associated class, and in some places you can substitute a good grade in the class for a good grade on the exam and just never take the dang thing. Now, let me emphasize, these exams are no joke. They're hard. One of them that I took many years ago had about six questions. You only had to answer four of them over the course of three hours, and you passed if you got two right and an additional one maybe half right or so. Like I said, they were hard. It was pretty common to see students retake exams because they couldn't pass them the first time, and although rare, some students did drop out because they couldn't get the grade they needed. The next phase is the lead up to the oral exam. Several things actually happen between taking the written exams and taking the oral exam. Typically, you will find an advisor, you'll put together a thesis committee, and you'll choose a topic that you want to start working on for your dissertation. Most of the oral exam actually consists of a presentation given on either what you hope to do or what you've already done with your research. 
after your presentation, the thesis committee will ask you some questions, typically just testing your overall knowledge in the area. It all sounds pretty daunting, but it's not that bad. Most of it's there to make certain that you, yes you, are ready to begin working on your dissertation. And more than that, most advisors don't even let their students take the oral exam until they're pretty certain that they'll pass it. There was that one guy. But anyway, after you complete your oral exam, it's time to start working on that dissertation, researching and writing it until it's time to defend. Defense, much like the oral exam, is mostly a presentation, except where with the oral exam you were talking about the work you hope to do, with your defense you're talking about the work you just finished up. Afterwards, the thesis committee will again ask you some questions, but they're there mostly to just show that you've pushed the research as far as you can. And then, once you've passed, congratulations, you've done it. You have earned your PhD and are now Dr. So-and-so, whatever so-and-so happens to be. I'll add that, just like with the oral exam, most advisors don't even let their students take their defense until they're sure they'll pass it. Now, of course, there's a whole lot more that goes into grad school and grad life than just those things, but that's at least a good start. And anyways, um, I'm out of tea. Bye.